All right. Uh, Robert Moshi Thompson is a computer science student as well as a paleoanthropological student uh, or uh, enthusiast. Uh, most of us are amateur fossil hunters and she's an amateur paleoanthropologist, which is super awesome and uh, has done some awesome work online with communicating paleoanthropology to the younger generation through memes and through other ways. Uh, and she's very he's very interested in the um, in Pleistocene humans and uh, genetic stuff, which we're gonna talk about now. So I hope you guys enjoy. I'm really excited. Okay, everyone's ready? We're ready. Okay, I am going to share this. Okay, uh, can you all see? Uh, all right, so um, everyone can see this, right? You guys can all see? It's up, we're good. All right, cool. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, today, uh, the fossil topic I'm going to be discussing is the Denisovans. Um, if you respond to this to this event, you probably know a little bit about the Denisovans or maybe have heard of them or something. Uh, but just to recap, Denisovans are an archaic human species. That means they're a member of our ancestors, but they're not homo sapiens. So they're a different species, but they're very much like us. Um, and the reason why I chose to present on the Denisovans today is because their discovery changed a lot of the field and um, it challenged a lot of our assumptions about what we believe to be true about our ancestors, especially with regards to admixture. Um, admixture is the mixing of um, two different species, at least for the purpose of the, this presentation, that is what it is. It's the mixing of different species that are related but are separate. So um, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about that today. Um, just going to recap what we're going to talk about. So first, we're just going to overview some basics so that everyone's on the same page. Um, next, we'll talk about the Denisovans themselves, but with regards to fossils, because the fossils and genetics are very different for the Denisovans. They tell a very different story. So we're going to talk about fossils first. Then we're gonna talk about genetics and admixture, some much more interesting things. Um, and then finally, at the end, we're gonna talk about why this matters so much and why this change, why this was, why this discovery was so important uh, in the field of paleoanthropology. So let's get started. So this is one piece of terminology that I wanna get out of the way because you may have heard different definitions of a hominin, but for the purpose of this presentation, this is the one we're going to use. Uh, so uh, for, like I said, for the purposes of today, we're going to assume that a hominin is all members of the lineage leading to modern humans that arose after the split with the homo pan last common ancestor. So pan is the genus of the chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. So Basically, a hominin is anything that's closely, more closely related to us than it is to the chimpanzees. Um, and I'm going to show you here what this looks like. So this is a human phylogenetic tree. It's a tree of human evolution, and it goes back 10 million years, which is quite far. It's before our split with the gorillas, which are our second closest cousins. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, there will be a 15-minute um, uh, Q and A session. So if you have any questions, just be sure to write them down, and I'll address them at the end. Uh, okay. Then, as I was saying, this is a human phylogenetic tree. This. Uh, can you all see my cursor moving around? Okay. So this purple stream right here. This is Pan, the chimpanzees. And then this blue stream, the stream that eventually led to us. These are the hominins. So blue is our side. Purple is their side. And as you can see, we split sometime in the late Miocene uh, around, I guess, about six million years ago. Um, and so basically, like I said, everything in this blue is a hominin. And that's what we're going to be focused on today because the Denisovans as well as ourselves are hominins. But we're mostly going to be focused on our genus, which is Homo. So as you can see, it's in light blue, and so we're just going to zoom in a little bit. So this here, this is a phylogenetic tree of all of the hominins that survived past two million years ago. Um, you can forget about this pink spot here. This is Paranthropus. 
Um, it's actually an australopith, so just ignore it for now. Just look at the rest of these. You can see us in the top right corner, sapiens. Then here we have Denisovans and Neanderthals. And then we have a few other more archaic species here. Uh, now you can also see that there are streams crossing over one another in a braided fashion. That represents introgression. Introgression or hybridization or admixture, whatever you wanna call it. It's the mixing of related species. Um, they're different species, but uh, they're still uh, mixing in terms of like um, mating and trading back genetic material. Um, and so like I, I, I may not have mentioned this earlier, but for the longest time, we believed that the Neanderthals were the only uh, archaic hominins to have uh, contributed DNA to the modern human population. But when we discovered the Denisovans, we found that that was not the case. And not only that, we discovered more. So um, can you all see these three streams on the right without the names? So these three streams represent hominins that we only know about from the genetic analysis of modern humans. Analysis that wouldn't have happened if we didn't encounter the Denisovan DNA in the state that it was in. So, um, and that's going to become very, very important. So I just wanted to um, show you guys what that looks like. Um, and also, you'll also notice that it's not a straight line of evolution, that there are many crisscrossing paths. Um, and uh, the Denisovans confirm, uh, confirm this idea as well, that it's not always a straight line every time. So um, since most of you know about the Neanderthals probably, or have heard of them, I'm just going to review them really quickly because they're actually very important to understanding the Denisovans because the two populations interacted so much. And we'll see that later. But basically, uh, the, this is, by the way, this is a reconstruction of a man found in the Shanadar cave in Iraq, and he's a Neanderthal. And as you can see, he looks quite human because well, that's basically what they are. So um, these Neanderthals, they lived in Western Eurasia. They went extinct about 40,000 years ago. Um, and so we know that they interbred with Homo sapiens or anatomically modern humans around uh, 47,000 to 65,000 years ago. So around maybe about the 50,000 year mark. Um, then uh, in 2010, the Neanderthal Genome Project, which is basically an organization dedicated to the study of the Neanderthal genome. They sequenced the Neanderthal genome and they found, this is cool, they found that uh, between one to 4% of the DNA of Eurasian populations is derived from Neanderthals. Um, so if you have any ancestors from Europe or Asia or even in the Americas, then you probably have a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry. Um, which I think is pretty cool. And uh, like I said earlier, we thought that they were the only one because for the longest time, most of the early paleoanthropology work was done in Europe, which is where the Neanderthals are. But if you were to look outside of Europe, you'd see that there are not just one, there is more than three. Um, and we'll talk about them soon. Now here we have the Denisovans, which like I said, are very, very similar to the Neanderthals. The Denisovans were first identified in 2010. Um, they were identified through DNA. So um, before we uh, reached this level of knowledge that we have now of DNA, we had this, um, this pinky bone actually, we had it in 2002, but we didn't actually know what it was until we looked at the DNA. Um, and so this pinky bone was from a girl who lived um, tens of thousands of years ago in the Denisova cave, which is in Siberia. Um, so because of the cold weather, the DNA was so well preserved that it's very easy to analyze and it's very high quality DNA. And it can tell us a lot about these Denisovans. Um, the first thing is that they're genetically distinct from Neanderthals and modern humans. Uh, based on this finger bone, you can't really tell that it's any different from any other human or hominin pinky bone, but upon genetic analysis, you'll see that they are definitely two different, if not two different species, then definitely at least two different subspecies. Um, but the point is that they're not the same, they're distinct. Um, and the DNA, like I said, is so good that actually 
we're able to retroactively identify previously found fossils as Denisovans. Um, and most likely, like I said, they're probably a different species, but I'm going to show you why we can't actually say that yet. So, um, except for a few molars that I couldn't find on, like that I couldn't find pictures of online, these are all of the Denisovan fossils we have. And so in order for a species to receive a name and a classification, we have to have an adequate individual representing that species. And that's just not the case here. You can see these fossils are very nondescript, not very complete, don't really tell us that much about the morphology. And in taxonomy or the classification of organisms, it doesn't matter how good the DNA is, the DNA alone is not enough. We have to have a type specimen um, which is like at least a semi-complete specimen to know what this creature was all about. And that's just simply not the case here. Um, in fact, this jawbone down at the bottom, this is the most complete Denisovan fossil that we have on record. And it's only half a jaw. Um, and in fact, this is one of the fossils that was retroactively identified because of DNA. So this fossil was found in 1989, but in 2019, it was, um, it was re- it was revisited and then we were able to find out that it actually matched the Denisovans. And this was found in China, by the way. It was not found in Russia. It was found at a different locale. Um, and so since there's very few fossils, there's not much to know via the fossils. Um, this is the Denisova cave, by the way, this picture right here. So um, again, like I said, not much to know. So we can all just go through them quickly on just one slide. Um, so first of all, the most obvious thing that we know based on where we found these fossils is that the Denisovans lived in Asia, probably North, Northeast Asia. So Russia, China, Siberia, that kind of region, very, very cold weather, um, very sparsely populated mountainous regions. Um, we know that the caves that they live in have been inhabited by Neanderthals at some point but we, can't def we cannot definitely conclude based on the fossils alone if they lived together um, in, those in, in those caves. All we know is that they both lived at them at some point in, in history. Um, the next thing is since so many of the remains are teeth, we know that their molars were unusually large, very, very large for a hominin. Um, or, sorry, not for hominin, for such a late hominin, it had much more archaic, large, and like, I would almost say chimp-like teeth. Um, and uh, we'll see why that's the case when we look at the genetic stuff. And then in terms of the temporal range, the oldest individual that we have on record lived 217,000 years ago. Um, hominin artifacts have been found in the cave around that time, so between two or 300 years ago, we know that hominins were making things in this cave, or at least left them behind in this cave. And then on the lower limit, they, uh, the, the like latest individuals that we have lived tens of thousands of years ago, um, at the very latest 50,000. So as you can see, like this is very, very little. Um, and the only reason why we know so much is because of the genetics. And so, I'm gonna spend one slide each talking about all of the different things that the genetics tells us about the Denisovans. And then we can explain why that's important later. So first, before we get into the genetic stuff, I just wanna clarify what the molecular clock is. Uh, you're probably gonna hear me talking a lot about like divergence times and when a certain species separated and became their own species rather than their common ancestor. And so this is done by molecular clock dating. The way this works, when you're trying to figure out if two organisms have a common ancestor or when their common ancestor was, you compare their genomes. And um, depending on the number of gene units that they have uh, different, you can calculate how long ago that change happened. So in this example, uh, so I would also like to point out, genes mutate at a predictable rate, at least some of them do. Not all of them do, but some of them do. And that's important. So look at this diagram, for example. Uh, over here on the far right, you can see that there are two letters highlighted on each side. That means that the DNA of these two organisms differs by two bases. 
And if one base changes every 25 million years, then that means we can calculate that their common ancestor probably lived 50 million years ago. Um, and we do that by comparing their genomes. Um, and I just wanted to get this out of the way because um, it is a little bit confusing. Wait, ha has everyone here heard of the molecular clock or are we like familiar with it to a certain extent? Okay, well, um, as long as anyone, no one has any questions, I'm gonna move on. Uh, okay, so the first thing that we know about the Denisovans based on their DNA is that they are definitely, as I said, their own taxon. A taxon means a, a system of classification. So um, it could either be that they're a species or a subspecies, um, or just a clad or a group of related organisms, but we do know that they stand on their own. So they're not just weird Neanderthals or um, different looking humans. They're their own thing and stand on their own. Uh, the next thing we know in terms of relative relations, they're more closely related to the Neanderthals than Denisovans. The same reason that I was talking about with the molecular clock analysis, based on the amount of difference, uh, there's less difference between Neanderthals and Denisovans, so they probably split off later. Um, you'll see uh, here that there's a red line that's pointing to Homo heidelbergensis. The, the reason is because, so Homo heidelbergensis is another hominin, and since it shares so many traits between the Neanderthals and Denisovans, it's thought of as one of the best candidates for their their most common ancestor, or bleh, excuse me, for their most recent common ancestor. The jury's still out, but it checks out for the most part. Like it makes sense given what we know about uh, all three of these species. But you get the point that they had a more recent common ancestor than we did with them. Uh, and then this is just a fun fact. This is the first time in the history of physical anthropology that a new human species has been formally described and analyzed initially because of DNA, not by morphology. Morphology, by the way, if you didn't know, is basically the appearance, structure, and function of an organism. So as, oppo as opposed to just the raw DNA. Um, so yeah, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's very important and very, very, uh, very new thing that's happening in the field. The next thing that we know uh, based on the DNA is their appearance. So uh, remember that pinky bone that I was showing earlier? This is an approximation of what that woman would have looked like. I think it's crazy that they're able to do this just based on the pinky bone and just based on looking at the DNA um, because DNA can really tell you a lot about what a person may or may not look like. So the first thing that is pretty easy to tell like right off the bat about a hominin is the their features. So we know that this woman, at least this woman in particular, and that the Denisovans in general would have had dark skin. They had brown hair and eyes. Um, her skin probably would have been a little bit darker than is portrayed here, um, but you get the idea. Uh, in terms of uh, their figure, they had a little bit more of a wider stature. So like even their face, they would have looked a little wide. Uh, you can kind of see in the picture that this girl's face is a little bit like more stretched out this way, um, even more so than Neanderthals. So this is a very specifically Denisovan trait. Next thing in terms of their facial structure, uh, they looked a little bit more like the Neanderthals. So they would have had the same brow ridge, the, uh, the lack of a chin, um, what else? The, the sloping foreheads. Uh, so if you were to see them at first glance, you might not be able to tell if they were a Denisovan or Neanderthal because at first glance, they look very, very similar, which makes sense given how closely th that we assume them to be related based on the DNA. Then uh, they also had large brains. Um, and the brains were actually larger than the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So that was pretty interesting find. Okay, the next thing, and this is, it's interesting that the DNA can tell this, but based on the DNA, we can actually tell when and where they lived. 
So uh, the first thing that we know based on the DNA is that they emerged or diverged from other species between mm -hmm. 744 to 190,000 years ago. Um, like I said earlier, the molecular clock dating depends a lot on which gene you choose to analyze, which is why there's such a like large range. But it's the same order of magnitude, hundreds of thousands of years ago they appeared. Um, and we know that they went extinct between around 30 to 14,000 years ago. And the reason we know this from DNA is because, uh, so as you can see, the, um, the line on here on this map goes all the way down to Southeast Asia and Oceania, which is strange because the Denisova Caves way up here and then the other cave in China, like it's way in North Asia. But so then how did we get all the way down here? Well, I mentioned earlier uh, a little bit about the genetic analysis of modern humans. So uh, the indigenous people of this region, so Australia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, just that general region, uh, they have about uh, between five and 8% of Denisovan DNA, uh, kind of similar to how, uh, for example, European populations have some Neanderthal DNA. Uh, and so going back to this uh, 30 to 14,000 year time period when the Denisovans would have been extinct, the reason why we know that they survived this late is because based on the genetic analysis of uh, indigenous people of the uh, Pacific Island region, uh, we know that the introgression happened around 14,000 years ago. So that means they had to have still been alive. And so that's how we know that they survived much longer. And then the other thing that we know based on the genetic analysis of modern humans is that they lived not just in Northeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia and, the Oce and Oceania. And the reason we know this is because um, people native to Northeast Asia have very, very little Denisovan DNA. But people indigenous to uh, Australia and uh, these islands down here have the most Denisovan DNA, up to 8%, like I said. And so that means the Denisovan, like it's too much admixture for them not to have been there. Um, the, the admixture did not happen on the mainland. It happened in these islands and the Denisovans would have had to cross oceans to get there. So that's pretty impressive. And it tells us a lot. And it's just based on DNA that we know this. Pretty amazing. Okay, and then the other thing that we know uh, is that they most likely did cohabitate with Neanderthals regularly. Um, they, uh, the reason we know this is because actually 17% of the Denisovan genome is Neanderthal in origin, 17%. That's a lot. And so it's, again, it's too much for there not to have been cohabitation. Um, and we'll also see an example, a very interesting example of a first generation Neanderthal and Denisovan hybrid um, found in the same Denisova cave where we suspected uh, Neanderthal interaction to have happened. Okay, now we're up to the good stuff, which is admixture. So these here, this table is all of the admixture stats for these three species that I could find. So uh, like I said, Denisovans have about 17% Neanderthal ancestry, uh, which is very, very high. It's much higher than any of the numbers on this chart. Uh, no Denisovan DNA was found in the Denisovan hominins that we have on record. That doesn't mean they didn't have any human ancestry. It just means that the individuals that we found didn't. It doesn't mean no De Denisovan have any human DNA um, because they most likely did. And then 4% uh, of the Denisovan DNA comes from an unknown uh, species. Oh, whoops. Comes from an unknown species. It might have been similar to Homo erectus, but it's hard to tell. Um, and I'm going to devote some time to talking about that because that is interesting in its own right. But what I really want the takeaway from this chart to be is that, as you can see, all three of these hominins have DNA from one another. And I couldn't find any stats for uh, Neanderthal Denisovan admixture, but I'm sure that if we were to analyze Neanderthals somewhere, we would find Denisovan DNA. It just simply either it hasn't been done or I haven't been able to find it. 
but you get the idea that these species are all overlapping. And that probably means the lines between species is not super clear cut, um, that the admixture was messy and that it wasn't always just discrete separate uh, boxes. Okay, well, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'm going to talk about a very special uh, hominin. This girl, well, a 13 year old girl, or she had to be at least 13 anyway, she lived 90,000 years ago. Uh, you may recognize this picture because it was on the earlier slide, because this is one of the Denisovan bones that we have. Uh, and we know based on the bone density that this girl was at least 13 years old and she lived around 90,000 years ago. And she was very special because on her mother's side, her all of her maternal mitochondrial DNA, everything on her mother's side is pure Neanderthal, all of it, everything, no, nothing else, just Neanderthal. But her father, um, her paternal uh, chromosomal DNA was mostly Denisovan. Um, he had some Neanderthal DNA, uh, which makes sense given the fact that, uh, like I said earlier, the Denisovans had a lot of Neanderthal admixture. And I just can't stress enough how amazing it is to have found this fossil because out of the very, very few, like four or five fossils that we have of these Denisovans, one of them happened to be one of the most important discoveries with regards to human admixture that's ever been made. Because this is a first generation hybrid. This means that this girl had a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. And that's the most direct evidence that we have of interbreeding. And it's very, very interesting. And this is just my personal opinion. I believe Den Danny was born in a mixed community, a community where the line between Neanderthal and Denisovan wasn't so clear cut because they were living together, hybridizing. Now, uh, you may recognize this as well. This is the uh, human phylogenetic tree. And the reason why I'm going back to this is because I've talked a lot about how the lines between different species is not always super cut and dry, and that uh, sometimes it's hard to tell what's a species and what's not. And um, so I wanted to draw your attention to this uh, eight to six million year time period right around where my cursor is right now. As you can see, uh, there's not a clear line between uh, between the two, they're kind of mixing into one another. And the reason why it's like this, the reason why it's separate even though they haven't split yet, it's because based on um, genetic analysis that we've done, hybridization between the ancestors of humans and the ancestors of chimps was happening for quite a long time. Hybridization that's very similar to this. Like, what I mean is um, it's not just a one-off thing. It was regular and it happened many different times in many different places. And so this kind of shows that um, we're going to have to actually rethink the way we think of species and um, the way we separate them. Um, and so this is why I'm going to talk about hybrid speciation. Uh, you may have, you may recognize this photo because uh, it was the cover photo for the event. Um, and so this is the skull of Sahelanthropus chadensis. I actually drew this. Um, you may have incorrectly heard me refer to it as a hominin. And unfortunately, as of this morning, I found out that that is actually not the case. It actually belongs more to the chimp side rather than to the hominin side. In fact, you can actually see Sahelanthropus's branch right here, and it's branching. It's branching almost as far as the gorillas, so it's very, very much more chimp-like than it is uh, like us. But it's still very important, and it's because of the hybrid speciation that I'm going to talk about. So, Sahelanthropus chadensis, uh, until recently was one of the most important candidates for the last common ancestor between chimps and humans. Um, so it lived close to the time of the split, which was around six to seven million years ago. 
So uh, Sahelanthropus would have either been the common ancestor or lived among the common ancestor. Um, and the reason why I felt it was important to bring this up is because this skull has um, features that are hard to classify. Some of its features were chimp-like, such as uh, the uh, size of its brain and nose. Some of its features were gorilla-like, such as the, like, the picture doesn't quite capture it, but the, the brow ridge is enormous, much more big than any other hominin. Um, it also has uh, some hominin, or it had contested hominin features, but that's just, um, that's considered not the case anymore because um, it was thought, Sahelanthropus was thought to be bipedal, but after anal analyzing its femur, it most likely was not. But it's still important to the discussion. The reason why it's important is because, like I said, it had mixed features. It had some chimpanzee features, some gorilla features. It's hard to classify. And if we're going to look back at this diagram, it makes sense that it would not be as clear cut because it is happening right around this hybridization. So the fact that this hybrid, uh, like this hybridization has been happening since the very beginning, it suggests that uh, mixing between two different species or more than two different species is actually most likely the rule and not the exception. So in other words, it would be more unusual for species not to hybridize. Or at, at the very least, it would be more unusual for uh, the great apes to do so because we see a similar pattern among gorillas. And uh, this is just my personal opinion. I believe Sahelanthropus is a chimp gorilla hybrid, um, like from the early period, because as you can see, they're very, very close. And uh, this uh, hominin is also thought to share traits with gorillas. Like I said, this huge uh, bony brow. So uh, like I said, might have participated in hybridization. But even if it doesn't, it's still a good illustrative example of how the lines between different hominins are not always exactly what you think they are. Now, um, hold on. Okay, now we're, uh, so you might have heard me mention this uh, unusual 4% of the Denisovan DNA comes from an unknown hominin. And uh, again, it's only known through DNA because 4% of the Denisovan uh, genome comes from a hominin that based on the DNA appears to have separated from our lineage about a million years ago. And so the last species that we know of to have done this is Homo erectus. So it's very likely that whatever species mated with the Denisovans uh, to produce this DNA was Homo erectus-like. And in fact, this is one of the rare times that the fossils and the DNA tell the exact same story. So um, you may all remember when I said that the Denisovans had these crazy large molars. And it's outside, of, it's, they're so large that they're outside of the range of Homo species. Uh, they're actually much more similar to hominins that lived millions of years ago, not thousands of years ago. So very, very archaic, um, kind of similar to Homo erectus. So if it was Homo erectus indeed that did mate with the Denisovans, that might explain why the, they have such large teeth because Homo erectus had teeth like that, those super, super archaic traits. Um, and this is a big surprise because again, like we've already found uh, the Denisovans and through the Denisovans, we found this. And again, through the genetic analysis of modern humans, we found at least three more. Who knows what else uh, is hiding out there? Um, and that's, that's, that really changes the story again, because that means that there are a lot more hominins than we know. Uh, and there are a lot more different uh, ways in which they interacted with one another. And I mean, thank God for DNA science, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to know any of this. But when you do it correctly, you can learn a lot. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, we're almost done. Okay, so what is the larger implications of this? Oh, by the way, uh, I mentioned earlier how uh, the Sahelanthropus chadensis discovery uh, was actually um, like the 
classification of it as a hominin was disproven. So uh, in honor of that, I drew this picture of Sahelanthropus chadensis, not looking like a hominin, but looking more like an ape, which is what it actually would have been. So that's why I chose to um, include this. Uh, and so that must have been a lot to take in. So I'm just going to synthesize what we went through and explain why all of this is so important. So first things first, the first thing that we learned from these Denisovans is that there were multiple different hominins and they were all over the place. They were all over the world, or at least they were all over Afro-Eurasia. And not only did they hybridize with us, they also hybridized with each other and they did it all the time everywhere. Um, it'd be more unusual if they didn't than if they did. Uh, and then another thing which I actually mentioned earlier is the, that messy speciation or uh, a much uh, more braided sort of evolution stream is actually more common than not. So, uh, it, and it makes perfect sense because if you think about it, um, species don't just suddenly stop talking to one another as soon as they mutate. Um, you still maintain similarities to, uh, to genetic communities that are close to you. And actually, um, even to this day, human ethnic groups diverge in a similar way. You might, um, like two populations might diverge and then they might uh, come back together. And the story of human evolution is very much like that. And um, it makes perfect sense. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe you guys have heard the term hybrid vigor. Uh, hybrid vigor is a phenomenon in which uh, a hybridized species uh, tends to have uh, positive and um, well-adapted traits that its parents didn't have. So basically, the whole is worth more than the sum of its parts in this case. And that might explain why this hybridization was so common because it's just such a good strategy. Um, and it, I mean, it may very well have made us who we are today. Um, and we did not do it alone, absolutely. And then the other thing that uh, that's important about this discovery is how much more valuable the DNA is than we thought. Um, before the DNA was mostly just a tool to help us, um, and hold on, how much time do we have? Okay, we have time. Um, and so for most of uh, the history of this field of study, the DNA, like I said, has just been another tool, uh, but it has never been the main event. And that's what makes this so unusual. But, um, and because at, it was, um, the field of genetics has taken a huge leap and the paleontology community has taken uh, advantage of that. And like I said earlier, like we were able to figure out that the Denisovans were in Southeast Asia without finding a single fossil there. And by the way, if you are wondering why we haven't found a fossil there, it's probably because it's just too hot. Like it's hot and humid. Fossils don't really form that well in that kind of uh, weather. And also um, there are a lot of tides. So the tides might have swept all of these bones away. Um, there might be Denisovan bones at the bottom of the uh, Indian Ocean, for all we know. But uh, the point is that uh, we learned more from the DNA than we thought we could. And the other thing that we also learned from the DNA, from the introgression into modern humans, is that hominins survived much later than we actually thought. Um, so the last Denisovan individual that we identified lived 50,000 years ago, but the predicted uh, introgression time was 14,000 years ago, which is 40,000 years later than we thought. And this never would have been found out if not for the DNA. And I am sure that if we do find Denisovan fossils down like in Australia and all of those other places, I am sure that it will match uh, what we believe to be true based on the DNA. Okay, that was a lot. Now, uh, it is your turn to uh, ask me questions. Does anyone have anything that they would like um, to be clarified? Hey, Robert, um, can we all come back together as a, as a group for the Q&A? You want to stop yeah. share? Okay. Like stop sharing my slide? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, so we'll okay. all come back together as a group and convene. 
Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, wow. How amazing. My brain has exploded into a thousand pieces. Thank you so much. That Wait, really? It ex oh, that makes me feel so good. Thank you. It was amazing presentation. Thank you for giving us so much to think about um, and to move forward in our own personal knowledge um, and learning more about this. And we do have some questions um, from the, there's a couple of questions in the chat if I want to, I know that you weren't, you weren't paying attention to that because you were too busy teaching and making our brains bigger, almost as, as big as the Denise bins. Um, I'll look through a few of them um, and I can probably answer some of them really quickly. It says Ilka wants to know, um, do you think it's possible there are more Denisovan, is it uh, Denisovan. Artifacts, Denisovan artifacts in museums that have not been identified yet for some that have been assumed to be Neanderthal? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, that is one of the major uh, tasks actually of, uh, of paleo is paleoarchaeology a word? Anyway, but you know what I mean, like uh, of that time period. So it is very, very difficult to find out what exact species made a certain type of lithic tool because they all, like within a certain period of time, they all made really similar things. So it is very likely that at least a few of the artifacts that we have on file are made by Denisovans. We just can't really tell for now though. Um. Mason, you want to ask your question about the penguin? So uh, <clears throat> one fossil that I've been looking at uh, mm -hmm. that I think is pretty cool because it comes at about the same time as Denisovans hasn't been tested and I don't think it would work if it was, uh, mm -hmm. but Penghu-1 from the waters off Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, do you think that might be an example of a Denisovan or a hybrid? Uh, it very well might be, but the thing is, um, I actually have not studied it enough, but I probably will get back to you. What, what time period was it found? Do you remember? Like um, what time period was it dated to? I won't, uh, well, I think the dating was somewhat difficult because it was found uh, by a fisherman actually who was fishing off the, the water there. So he found it in a, in, a, uh, in a net. But I think the fauna was around 100,000 years old, uh, maybe a little younger, older. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Well, um, if it was, if it did like the, and in my head, the ideal, like, secretly Denisovan fossil would probably be a regular looking human jaw with large molars. So if that is what this Pengu um, jaw is, then I think it's an excellent candidate for a possible, like, Denisovan in disguise. Okay, let's see what other questions. And Adrian was interested in, where did Cro-Magnon go? Oh, Cro-Magnon is actually a defunct um, classification. The Cro-Magnon, uh, it's named after a fossil found in France of an early anatomically modern human. So we are basically Cro-Magnons. We didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, although I think that some of the Cro-Magnons were thought to be Neanderthals, but uh, all that I can tell you is that the Cro-Magnon, uh, like it's a defunct classification. It's not really used uh, anymore, but it was at one point. So yeah. Great. Now, I think that that handles everything from the chat box. If anybody has a question, why don't you raise your hand and you can unmute and ask it. Does anybody have a question? Okay, you, uh, Jean has a question. Go ahead, Jean. Has, has anyone done microware analysis of the tooth to get an idea of what uh, what they were eating. You know, are there scratches from nuts or sc tiny scratches from abrasive uh, grasses? Uh, have you seen anything about that? So I did for the preparation of this uh, presentation read an article uh, talking about exactly that, but um, I was actually reading it to learn more about its connection to that for percent Homo erectus. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I didn't pay as much attention to the uh, paleodontology as I probably should have. But what I do remember is that 
they ate a, a varied diet, but it would have been probably much more similar to Homo erectus because I mean, out of all of the features that were conserved from Homo erectus, it was the teeth. So what I can tell you based on that is that <clears throat> they probably had a similar diet. Mm -hmm. And what was that diet of Homo erectus then? That I actually don't know off the top of my head. No. I know, oh no, actually I'm lying, I do know. Um, at least in Asia, uh, it was a lot of just random like big game animals. Uh, they were very skilled hunters, but they also collected um, fruits and berries and um, uh, nuts and things like that. Um, they may have eaten bugs, but we're not so sure about that. Um, but yeah, they were very omnivorous. That was part of, uh, that was part of what made us who we are. Uh, Robin has her hand up. Yeah, go ahead. I just I wanted to say, first of all, fantastic talk. I worked on my PhD about, let's see, in the 19, early 1990s, and we were just dreaming of doing what you were presenting. It's really, it's just so exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting when we try to talk about humans, we always somehow think we're different from all other organisms and everything you're talking about, the different um, you know, species diverging and then and then hybridizing so commonly thought of in plants and other kind of other kind of animals. Um, but we kind of forget that humans are also animals. <laughs> so, you know, everything you're saying just so interesting. I don't really have a question other than saying this is sort of my dream of what I'd get to, a talk I'd get to hear 30 years from when I was studying DNA. So thank you. Oh, I'm so glad that that um, this could be the case for you. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. That makes me feel really good, actually. Oh my God. Okay. Um, so uh, there's, how was, how was the fullest pinky found? Is it a burial type situation or just in a case? Fossil, fossil pinky, fossil pinky. Like how was the pinky bone found? Well, Tina wants to know, was it a, was it buried or was it just in the cave? Was it, I guess, was there any ceremonial things around it? I'm assuming. I don't know, actually. Unfortunately, I just don't know. I'm sorry. I actually don't know very much about how these fossils were found. Yeah, and sorry. How do they how how do they reconstruct the whole face and everything from just that pinky? I just could found that amazing. So um, think of it this way: we look the way we look because of our genes. So if you understand which genes are associated with which traits, you can look at an organism's genome and determine what it would have looked like. So for example, for me, if you were to, look, so I have green eyes, and if you were to look into my genome, you would find genes and alleles that are associated with green eyes. And so if you use that logic uh, to backtrack a little bit, then you can actually, because I mean, let's be honest, like most humans kind of basically look alike. Like we have the same basic plan. All that can really differ that much between us is maybe like facial shape and then like skin color maybe. But other than that, um, other than that, like, yeah, pretty much everything's the same. So yeah, does that make sense? Adrian wants to know, uh, what are you looking forward to next in the developments in this field? What I am dying for is to learn about the introgression of African hominins into modern day sub-Saharan African populations, because this is a field that has been completely ignored. It's totally untouched. It's like completely like been ignored because like I said, a lot of the first paleontology or paleoanthropology was done in Europe. And so like, they didn't want to believe that like the first humans were from Africa. Um, and so that's why uh, there's been basically, since we found no Neanderthal uh, genes in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we believed that they had no admixture, but then later uh, we found out that that's not the case. So to answer your question, that is what I wanna know. I wanna know what African hominins uh, interbred with us, not just in Europe and Asia. Okay. Um, I see someone uh, asking if we can estimate the brain size of Denny. So um, yes, 
you may have seen on my slide about their appearance that they had, uh, that I said that they had a large brain. And that's because um, in their genes, they have genes that are not only associated with just a larger head and brain size, but also higher encephalization. Encephalization is basically the number of uh, neurons that you have per like, I think it's like square inch or something of your body. But basically uh, it means, this is oversimplified, but basically higher encephalization means higher intelligence. Generally, very generally, but that's the way that you can think about it in this context. So yes, we can estimate the brain size and it was in fact much larger than the others. And it makes sense given how wide and stocky they were compared to us. Okay. Any other questions? Patty, you look like you have your hand up. Me? No, I'm, I'm, my mind is spinning because I'm just trying to think how in the world were the, this many, um, beings in coexistence at one time it, it just it just blows me away i think i can answer your question of how um so uh i think it was ilka saying that um we think that we're special or unique um and so obviously that's not the case so i'm going to turn your attention to dogs there are so many different types of subspecies of dog. There's the domestic dog, there's dingoes, there's um, jack, wait, jackals, that's what they're called, right? There's jackals, there's, um, there's like a billion different types of wild dogs out there. And they are all, for the most part, reproductively compatible. Some of them might not be, but there are so many. Uh, oh yeah, and the wolf, of course. So, um, and you could think that way for uh, all sorts of different organisms. Um, the point is just when you have such a large population, um, you have more genetic diversity. And a lot of times that ends up meaning that you have more like different species. I understand that it's hard to wrap your head around when it's humans and not animals, but uh, from a bi purely biological standpoint, that's the reason why there were so many, because that's just what, ha what happens naturally in this uh, type of situation. What I don't understand is how there could be different species of humans living together, working together, and we can't figure out how to do it with one species right now. <laughs> well, um, I can tell you how that's possible too. So, um, if you were to look at a Neanderthal or a Denisovan, you'd think they look a little weird with their forehead, but basically they look the same. So you wouldn't have been, especially back then with the level of science they had back then, you would not have known that there was any, that they were a completely different species. You'd probably think that they were just like a different tribe or ethnic group or something. You wouldn't know. Um, because like we have all the genetics, but they didn't have that. All that they had was their friends and family. And, and AM says we're speciating at this very moment as we speak. Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, although uh, there is not as much um, genetic like separation for speciation to happen, but I mean, Still like the same idea, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we are always constantly speciating. Uh, Eugene? Yeah, I think Neanderthals, most of the, the, the remains are from cold climates. And uh, the last I saw the, uh, the, uh, the Neanderthals physically were immensely strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a researcher who worked on human fossil skeletons for many years said that a young Neanderthal female would be so much stronger than the strongest modern human male. Mm -hmm. So they're hunting big game up in uh, very cold climates where it's really hard to make a living. Mm -hmm. And you're hunting big fierce animals. Uh, and that's one of the great, one of the great separations e ecologically 
uh, between um, anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals. Um, and then the other aspect of our diet is that we make fire mm -hmm. and making fire makes meat far more digestible. You're not chewing raw meat and taking hours just to chew a, uh, you know, five ounces of, of raw meat. Mm -hmm. uh, we're making a lot of vegetables digestible mm -hmm. and uh, which otherwise they wouldn't and, 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 and removing the toxins in a lot of them. So that was a huge separation. And then of course there's, there's uh, 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 crushing nuts um, for the high fat, high protein uh, uh, material there. And those are really unusual human traits. Mm -hmm. And the Denisovans or Denisovans, of course, with those huge rear molars, they may have been able to crush foods that we would have to take two stones and bang together to. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it makes a lot of sense that in a continent the size of Europe or an immense continent the size of Eurasia, that we'd have three different species really living different lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, we hybridize, but then we should you know, you know, also recall that um, uh, what you see so often in anthropological remains and archeological remains is uh, signs of uh, warfare uh, raiding and aggression. So, you know, we can't assume that everybody got along all the time if we're trying to live in exactly the same area, mm -hmm. you know, that it was, you know, an intermediate climate for us. So anyway, I, I don't know what you think of those. Yeah, well, actually, it's interesting you bring up the warfare thing, because this is another thing that I learned just recently because of new reports that came out. The uh, You may have heard the famous uh, Neanderthal uh, cannibal thing about how they found puncture wounds in um, in skulls. Uh, so when these were further analyzed, it was actually found that the scars, especially on Neanderthal bones, are much more consistent with ritual excarnation. So um, in some places like Papua New Guinea, for example, um, it's actually considered a ritual or rite of passage. This sounds strange, but the ritual is after your loved one passes away, you uh, remove their flesh. In some cultures, it's uh, thought of as to like pass them on to the dead, but also at the same time, um, it actually is a really good preventative measure to um, prevent against like um, jaguars and stuff coming and digging up graves. So um, it's actually a lot less likely that they participated in warfare because small tribal uh, band societies, uh, they can't survive uh, warring with each other very long. It just requires too many resources. So um, it's actually much more likely that it would have been peaceful cohabitation. That doesn't mean it, they always got along, but it's more likely than not that they did. Um, and yeah, like there's also a common misconception that we like, murdered all of the other hominin species, but actually it's much more likely that, um, remember how you were just saying how the Neanderthals are very, very specifically made to do one thing, which is live in the cold and eat meat, which is also what I was born to do, by the way. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it's that over-specialization that caused their downfall for the most part. And um, I mean, we like the sensational, like, oh, we killed all the other humans and now we're on top, but like reality and fantasy just don't always add up, you know? Does that make sense? Mason, do you wanna make a comment with the projectile? Uh, the Neanderthal in the Smithsonian was killed. Oh yeah, yeah, actually you're right about the projectile weapon thing um, that the Neanderthals, uh, have most likely not created projectile weapons. Uh, their weapons, and this is why they were so strong, their weapons probably just would have been gigantic spears that they don't even throw, they just jab them. And that's why Neanderthals are always found with broken bones and things like that. And they were probably very skilled like in the medical 
uh, field because the amount of things that they had to recover from with their technology back then is not possible without an extremely detailed knowledge of um, medical botany. So it's very impressive. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we certainly at some point need to have a talk on, on with the NHSM that's dedicated to Neanderthals because I mean, just like a few day, a few days ago, we found out beyond a shadow of a doubt that they that could, they talked. yeah, that they can speak and hear in the same range as humans. Yeah, um, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I always knew this, and I knew there would be a paper one day confirming it, and now there is, and this has been the best day of my entire life. Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> In fact, uh, Mason, I don't know if you remember, but Ari actually made a meme, and the meme is exactly about that, about that discovery, and I made it the cover photo, so, um, yeah. And what Robert's talking about is a, is it a, fa is it Facebook or Instagram? Yeah, on Facebook, I have a meme group. It's uh, dedicated to paleoanthropology memes. It's not very active, but uh, the few active participants we have are always making good content, so. And that's how Robert and Mason uh, uh, met each other and mm -hmm. how we were lucky enough to have Robert come and um, make us all smarter. And what I want to say is we started with saying, and, and there was a little bit of uh, self-deprecation and saying that I'm an amateur um, anthropologist or an amateur this, an amateur scientist. Well, remember that Charles Darwin was amateur scientist as well. And so I don't put any um, uh, anything on, on what an amateur can do or, or, or not. That's just, it's, it's all the power of, of your passion leading you forward into discovery and sharing with others. So I appreciate um, uh, you sharing with us, Robert, this evening. I appreciate everybody for being here today, learning with, each other, with, learning with us. George, you have something? Yeah, just a comment about human aggression. Um, it used to be thought at one time that human hunting was responsible for the megafauna extinction in North America about 13,000 years ago. But that theory is, uh, it's, it doesn't hold as much weight as it used to. We actually think it was an asteroid impact. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, you're exactly right. Great. Yeah. Do you have a question? How did they like, um, how did the, how did they speak together? Like, uh, like how did the Denisovans speak to each other? How did they speak to each other? Did they use language? Yeah, probably like exactly what you and me are doing right now. Um, I mean, probably they would have spoken different languages just like anyone else. But um, I mean, uh, if what Mason said is correct, that, um, that these uh, hominins definitely did speak then yeah, they probably just spoke just, this, just like us, just like what you and me are doing right now. Does sure. that make sense? All right. Well, this was phenomenal. I hope that we get to have you back um, to share some more with us uh, all the way from Winnipeg, Canada. Um, and I hope to see all of you back together again with our community of the curious to learn tomorrow night about the importance of milk and mammals and what what's all up with that. Um, surely to be fascinating uh, discovery and look deep a real deep dive into into mammals. Uh, what makes a mammal a mammal? So I hope you'll join us. And if you are not already a member of the Natural History Society, please, please, if you like what we're doing, help us to get through what the next 91 years of, of scientific discovery in Maryland and education um, and become a member. Uh, help make our birthday wish come true. We get 91 new members uh, to the society. It's always a great gift. You can give somebody a membership. If you don't know what to buy them, if they have one of everything already in their house, get them a membership. Uh, to the society and and help them get smarter because that's what we can all do is get smarter together thanks very much
Mason, you want to say anything past passing words? This was a wonderful presentation, and Mason is, is busy scheduling all kinds of phenomenal things <laughs> for the uh, for the Fossil Club. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah, so thanks. This was an epic talk. Wonderful. Uh, great job of really uh, explaining it for everyone in a way that makes sense, which is a really hard thing to do, uh, to take all these big words that scientists make that really have no good meaning um, and taking them down into something that everybody can understand. Um, even I get like, I have massive problems reading papers sometimes because they use way over complex words. You did a wonderful job and I'm so glad we had you. Uh, and I hope that uh, you're welcome back anytime you'd like. Um, Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Mason. It was wonderful. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. I had fun too today. <laughs> and I hope to see all of you back next time, uh, next month, to learn about Megalodon, the largest shark to ever live. Yes. Oh, man. Actually, I would like to come see that. You're, You're more than welcome. Well, yeah, I'll ask send you about it afterwards. Yeah. And by the way, your dream's probably going to come true. Uh, Professor Lee Berger was about to send Homo naledi fossils up to the Paleoproteome people before the pandemic started. Unfortunately, oh it ended. But he's he's going to send them up there, and we'll have some, at uh, quote unquote, genetic material or at least pro protein material from them soon, hopefully. You know, I met him when I was a kid, when I was 17, what? and I, I got his autograph. And it was awesome. And I was so pumped to meet him. And he's like my favorite, like, just. He's a cool uh, guy. Burger.